Next, from Springfield, retired Major General John Borling recounts his six and a half years as a POW in Vietnam. This runs about 50 minutes. So in those early brutal years when you read about it, you know how bad it was, the, the notion that we had to survive was important, but it was much more important to survive with honor We wanted you to be proud of us when and if we came home. And I wrote this book starting to write it as a way to stay competitive, as a way to make time an ally, a way to run an uncertain race so that my wife and little girl who was three months old when I left, seven months or seven and a half years old when I came back, would have some kind of legacy in case I didn't make it. And I would tap it through the walls as I created these things in my mind so my, my fellows would carry it with them gave them something to do as well. And as the years went on, the book grew. And if you looked at it, you'd see that John McCain did the forward. But uh, later on, when conditions improved modestly, uh, in fact, they tried to fatten us up the last year or so, uh, then it was a more normalized, but never a real POW setting. We were always considered to be, by them, war criminals, and then released in 1973. And these poems were, I'd been carrying with me and reciting them daily, reciting this book almost daily. And we got to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. That's where they flew us out to on February 12, 1973. And after a first meal, what was the first meal? What do you think you want to eat when you have your first meal? Think about it. Have you ever been, how many people have been really hungry here? I mean, really hungry. So what meal would you hanker for more than any other meal? Eggs. Shout it out. Bacon and eggs. Ba well, bacon and eggs, breakfast, you hanker for breakfast. And then once you've had that breakfast, you go back to having a, you know, a Coke and a candy bar. But that's, you know, you had your, you had your breakfast. That's a fighter pilot's breakfast, a Coke and a candy bar. Uh, and I ran out, still in a bathrobe, ducked out of the hospital and went to the BX. I didn't have any money and to the post exchange. And I said, I need a tape recorder because I wanted to download. That wasn't even a verb in 1973. I want to download. <laughs> and this guy comes back and he's got this black shoebox looking thing. And I said, no, no, I, you know, Tanbergs or, you know, Akai's with the tapes and the reels. Remember, guys? <laughs> yeah. And he laughs and he said, this is a cassette recorder. And I had no idea, but I owned one. I, in fact, I just took it. I didn't have any money. And I went back later and paid for it. And went back with the little cassette things and started downloading uh, these poems. It's strange, because if we went up to a teenager today and handed him or her a cassette recorder, they'd say, what the heck is that? You know, you, no clue. Uh, and then I buried the book for 40 years. And it was John and others, who you'll see on the back, who came and said, you need to publish before you die. Even though I have this mirror that talks to me every morning and says, Borling, don't ever die. And, uh, <laughs> and I intend to take that instruction. The book's in four parts. The first part is the flying part, because flying equals freedom equals flying. And the second part is the dark and bitter stuff, the human nature things that we wrestle with and the POW experience. The third part are the holidays, the wonderful ups and downs of the Christmases and Thanksgivings and birthdays. You know, when the family comes over and you find out of all your relatives, you like yourself the best. <laughs> <laughs> and they would expect a Christmas poem, I'd pass it through the walls and then and then the last part of the book is Sea Story, Southeast Asia Story. Writes about all the things you really care about. Sex, politics, religion, love, hate, war, peace. Every human emotion I could consider in a sea story. We've got Navy guys with us, but this is Southeast Asia Story. So again, my advice to you is read the front, read the back, and then dive in and out of the poems and laugh, cry, and think, and be careful with this piece of my soul. 
You want a couple tastes of some of the stuff? Do you? The first poem in the book is called The Derelict. People have been to Arizona, Phoenix, out here. Did you go further west and get out to Ajo, that deserted base out there in the desert? Your heads are nodding. Ajo was the model for this. I'm not going to give the whole thing. I'm just going to try to give you a little flavor. It talks about an old airplane, in this case a B-17, flying back into those deserted kinds of bases trying to go home again. The derelict. The West was a patchwork of color flung over a racing sky and the wind. The wind was a lover's whisper that needed no reply. And the strip was of weed corn concrete scarring the desert floor and a derelict came flying. Flying, a derelict came flying long final to zero four. And it talks about this B-17 going back and trying to find its past, trying to find its present. The last lines of the poem, and it doesn't hack it, the last lines of the poem are, take off roll in the farewell drone, unheard in the desert air, outbound in search of home again, trying to go home again. And all who follow it home again will never find it there. Well, my poems, a lot of them rhyme, uh, which is strange in a present day context. In fact, I had a New York critic say, uh, she didn't say poems, she said, poems, you poems. You know, you rhyme your poems. And I said, yeah, I thought poetry was supposed to rhyme, you know, a lot of it anyway. And, uh, and she says, and you know what else? She said, two of your poems. Uh, you may have created rap, for which I most humbly apologize. <laughs> now, I do a lot of, I like the sonnets. And I know some of you, and in fact, I've got you doped out already. Some of you are rabidly Elizabethan. <laughs> Others of you, you particularly, are a devotee of the Petrarchan structure. I know I've got you typed. I saw you when you walked in. You are definitely a Petrarchan type. <laughs> but to satisfy both of you, believing in compromise, I, mel I melded the two. Still used the 14 line, did a rhyming couplet at the end that solves everything in, that goes before and has a rhyme scheme that's attendant to sonnets. Uh, I'll just give you a piece of a sonnet called First Light Flight. I did it actually on the radio this afternoon. Did anybody hear it? So it's new news, old news. Live through it again. It's great. Uh, I used to fly weather recce out of George, and we've got guys who flew F4s at George. Raise your hand again, colleague from George. He's already left. No, there he is. Be brave. No, we were at George Air Force Base. This is where Roy Rogers had his museum. I rode horses with Puerto Rican teenagers about three years ago on the surf of Puerto Rico, of Puerto Rico, and we're riding along. I said, God, I feel like Roy Rogers. No clue. <laughs> but I'll give you something for your Puerto Rican friends. You know the most overused word in the English language, at least in America? Awesome. Gosh, I hate the word awesome. <laughs> so I asked the kids in Port from Puerto Rico, I said, what's the equivalent of awesome? And they said, brutal, brutal. And if you say, que brutal, oh, you're saying, hey, something's really great. How the hell do we get on that? The, uh, Oh, I was talking about flying weather reckeys out yeah, in the early morning, and you could have multiple, multiple sun, sun, sunrises. So this poem called First Light Flight talks about flying at dawn. Pale golden talons stir the eastern sky. Another fledgling day departs the hills. It takes the air as thermal falcons fly cascading light as carefree first flight thrills. And who attends that noble, noble soaring birth from mountain crag or gentle rolling plain may marvel 
from their vantage point on earth but miss so much, not of the sky's domain. But I'm not of the earth. At altitude I greet the infant day with engine song, my contrails etched on endless morning blue and rare abandon urging me along. It's here, unfettered brother men in thrall to first light flight, the one judged best of all. I really like that one. I think you can probably tell. Uh, in the second part, have we got 15 minutes yet before we're running out of time? Angela's my timekeeper here. Am I going too long? You guys are still with me? Can we go a little longer? Is it okay? Yeah. All right. How much? I, I've got 20 minutes left. Oh, I'm a fat 20 minutes left. I'll give you guys two minutes for questions. See ya. <laughs> the second part is the dark and bitter stuff, the POW stuff. The hard part about doing this book that you buried for 40 years, and Myrna and I did not want to be professional POWs, so we, we rarely referenced it, asked about it. Uh, doing the book now is thrust it back, and sometimes it's difficult. And this one's a little difficult. Hanoi Epitaph. Remember where I was at this time. I was in a space no wider than this, no longer than this, and the walking was two and a quarter paces and turn around and go the other way. When days of dim hope and boredom abound and you half, half listen to the desperate sound of empty tap code conversation. When the heat is so hot and the cold, so cold, you think of your youth and how you've grown old. Now live confined, it's, it's, it's life's lowest station. When the, when the floor is furrowed, by tired feet and life slips away neath the pounding beat, you trudge on in the dark desolation. Uh, the poem goes on in a similar vein for about 15 verses, and it concludes with these kinds of thoughts. When years have passed, the many Decembers, and no one knows, and no one remembers the sound of your voice, your face, or your name. So you dream of steel chargers, skies to roam. Mostly you dream of just going home. But you dream without hope or conviction. So I tapped that a verse at a time through the walls and didn't get much reaction as it passed its way down. We had maybe 12 guys that were lined up down there, but a day or so later they said, hey, about this Hanoi Epitaph thing, we're thinking of forming a suicide pact and we're wondering if you'd like to... <laughs> Actually, we had optimists and pessimists up there. I appreciate your index of humor, sir. It's exactly where it should be. You're disturbed, not deranged, just a little disturbed. It's a... You join me. Uh, no, the optimists, it's in the book, by the way, this next line, it's an original. Uh, we had optimists and pessimists. The pessimists thought we were gonna die up there and they wouldn't even send our bodies home. The optimists were sure they'd send our bodies home. And uh, <laughs> nothing like a little gallows humor to get you through, right? Yeah. And then it's the holidays. Then it's the holidays. And uh, one thing was called a part of it. So I had to write a Christmas poem every year. And 
you know the pathos. We've already talked about relatives and things and how it goes up and down at Christmas time and other times when families gather. So I wrote a thing called A Part of Christmas going back to Chicago uh, and it starts out like this. When, when Jack Frost starts, the warming hearts and old man Smith ain't mean. When reindeer fly and you can buy a purple evergreen, then something's up and you know what? It's all a part of Christmas and it goes on and talks about going to the walnut room for lunch and it talks about doing a number of things uh, but then ends up with the pathos of you're alone as we all tend to be with our own thoughts on a Christmas Eve. I did it and that, so that was fun. There was a year when I did one called Mommy Where Is My Daddy? Where I imagine my daughter Lauren laying in bed listening to Myrna pacing on Christmas Eve and telecommunicating with her the thoughts and then Myrna getting the thoughts and responding back and then me answering from across the way. That did spawn a suicide pact and uh, <laughs> but luckily we averted serious loss and I'm not going to do it tonight. It really rips my heart out but if you want to if you get inside the book. I recommend, like most poetry, if you're impelled, read it out loud. Poetry is best when read with expression. Uh, your own, your own interpretation. I don't, th even though some of this stuff is at various levels, most of it's just like looking at a, at a, at a stool. Imagine this is Andy Warhol, and Andy Warhol or something like that. You either like it or you don't like it. It's either a soup can or it's a whatever. Uh, or it's some wonderful piece of art. All art ought to give you a plus or a minus almost immediately and I hope my stuff does that. In fact, I go so far as to think this is diverging now down a tributary uh, that is important but not central to what I was talking about and that goes back to our problems with education in America. I would submit that our problems in education in America begin with the fact that we've not defined what we want out of our public school system in terms of educational purpose. So if you all would quickly finish this sentence in your mind, the purpose of the American educational system is to, I'm going to give you a couple seconds, the purpose of the American educational system, K1 through 12, is to, everybody got their answer? Here's mine. The purpose of the educational system is to provide the students with the skills and the confidence to identify and solve problems. That's what we do in life. And have good manners <laughs> and appreciate beauty. Appreciate beauty. Wouldn't it be a wonderful world? If, and I'm a trained engineer from the Air Force Academy, but I majored in humanities. And I've always been convinced that the world would be a better place if we would just pause and accept and embrace beauty with creativity being the essence of the human condition. I mentioned that today on the radio. And it doesn't have to be artistic creation or poetry or music or whatever. I wanted to be a jazz pianist, but got laughed out of the Playboy Club <laughs> one night, I did. I was playing up in the library in the old place on Walton Street. I was playing Jesus Loves Me. Do you know the song? <laughs> Can we hear a little bit here? Would you start it off, ma'am? <laughs> Jesus loves me, yes I know. For the Bible tells... Very nice, very nice. Heartland, Heartland, Illinois down here. But at that point, I had the bass and drums kick in and we did five-finger Brubeck chords and swung Jesus Loves Me. Oh, really? <laughs> This blonde in the back, blonde in the front, blonde in the back started giving me the old Chicago razzmatazz, you know, no talent, you know, get off the stage. So I decided then and there I would never be a jazz pianist and became a fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Married the blonde, yes, that's true. <laughs> beauty, the love of beauty. So skills and confidence to identify and solve problems, have good manners and appreciate beauty. And I would hope in my book that you would get some flashes of beauty. You'd either like it or you wouldn't like it. 
and we go on. But now we're through the third section, and we're going to the last section, which is Southeast Asia story. And it's, it's about 12 line stanzas as you go through it. And I'm just going to give you, since we are falling into the historical peril of fighting wars forever, historically it's the end of nations or the great diminishment of same because it affects national spirit, it affects treasure. Basically, we just don't like it. If the game is worth the candle, the Congress needs to do its job and solicit that public opinion, fear, hate, loathing, whatever interest, whatever it is, and then declare it, absent the president's ability to respond to attack, obviously, and then give it up to the military and mission type orders and it says, don't take care of that. And wrap it up. Okay. So this is what's out of this is what's in C story. So once elected, war the objective. Wrap it up. Neat and fast. It won't be pretty, and that's a pity, but better first than last. Moral, immoral, senseless quarrel. Winners are right in history. I tell you once more, the fact is in war, no substitute for victory. And I suggest that as a nation, we can hearken to those abbreviated words of MacArthur. Mm -hmm. And be prepared as a nation to take up arms when it is truly in our interest or when there is truly a fear factor or when, or when there's a hate factor. That's the rough stuff of war. I wish it were not so, but it is, and we deal with that subject and many others in Sea Story. So again, get in, the, in and out of the four sections. You will laugh, you will cry, you will hopefully think. Did you want me to give you a piece of that rap thing just for fun? Finish up there and then turn it over to questions and answers? Do I dare? Remember, I was writing some of this for fighter pilots, all right? Well, in fact, I was writing it all for fighter pilots. The story concerns a couple of woodpeckers. I've got to give you some background. Down in Texas, one's named Maggie. Magnusons are always Maggie in the vernacular. Uh, he's the old guy. He's the instructor pilot. And Jamie is the young guy, Jamie Joe. And they decide, after some things here, that they're going to take a cross country out to the west. So it starts out. You ready for this? All right, this is the rap stuff. Well, way down south in the Texas flat, where Prickle Pear and Jack Rabbit at, live two woodpeckers in a sawed off stump, a looking all the day for something to thump. <laughs> well, it's white man rap anyway, I don't know. It's, you know. <laughs> it happened one day, as I recollect, sitting on a choya with something to peck. Maggie, the old guy, turned to Jamie, the young guy. Say, brother, oh, I got me an ID, think we ought to know. From yonder back north to San Antonio, local flying wood is dry as a bone. Cottonwood, willer, other thorny thing, just don't fill the bill, that empty holler ring. But I heard tell of a promised land where trees grow tall and the peckins grand. California redwood supposed to be best. I be of a mind to mosey on out west. Well, the story goes on in the same kind of vernacular and the sing-song stuff. And they, in fact, fly out of Laredo, Texas until they get out west to quick stop at Kirtland. That's in Albuquerque. Quick stop at Kirtland for turnaround. Moon pie and coal, another tank of gas. Soon headed west again, really hauling fast. All right, all right. <laughs> Oak Creek Canyon. Everybody knows Oak Creek Canyon, north of Phoenix. Real pretty passed by. Jamie thrashing wheeze, but Maggie stacked high. The two ski daddled in their feathered flight, pleased as Mr. Bullfrog on a moonlit night. Uh, it talks about them flying on. And then the weather gets a little iffy, and they've got to get up and get an instrument clearance to get on top of the clouds. And they do this, which we've all done. You've heard it. We are entering into holding. Uh, they entered into holding by and by. Weather might touch you to Maggie's eye. We better take a tack in. 
Radar 2, these are ways to get down. Tack and Radar 2, caution be the watchword, for we have a chew. Well, Jamie started fretting, young and bold. They called for clearance, continue to hold. Jamie, so bothered, so anxious to peck, he rolled to his back and split est to the deck. That's a maneuver where you lose a lot of altitude and you go down and hopefully you pull it out before you hit the ground. Well, luck of a rebel helped him down, landed on a tree, commenced to pound. He just reared back for that first giant peck when come bowl of lightning struck him in the neck. <laughs> Poor old Jamie, laying in the brush, tail feathers singed in a deathly hush. Maggie was on final. He touched down good next to fine full stop and a likely hunk of wood. Poor old Jamie, laying in the brush, tail feathers singed in a deathly hush. I just said that. Maggie stood looking, shook his head. He's looking at Jamie. Maggie stood looking, shook his head. It's a wonder I declare you ain't dead. Now, I've seen me some sights and heard me some tales. There's one thing I know that holds for all males. Boy, before you fly again, think on these words. It's true for man and it's true for birds. No matter what you call it, love or sin, don't be such a hurry. Put your pecker in. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. You told me this crowd had literary potential. And at that point, I will end with a story that you've all been waiting for. It's the story of the Kennedys on their wedding night. I guess picked up by the frogman in the waterbed. I don't know, but it came out. Jacqueline turned to Jack Kennedy on their wedding night, apocryphally and said, what kind of man are you, Jack Kennedy? Wondering how I'm going to get out of this? <laughs> what kind of man are you, Jack Kennedy? And he said, I'm an idealist without illusions. I would leave you with the finale of prepared remarks with the heartfelt notion that we Americans, I think, thrive on the fact that down deep we are essentially idealists but without illusions. We are willing to accept broad error, mistake. We do like honesty. But at the end of the day, if we thrive as a nation, it's because you and you and you and we have an idealism that will sustain us into greater generations of the future. I try to imperfectly march that path. I'm sure you all do it much better than me, but let us go forward as a nation, as a people, and not be afraid of American idealism and the notion that shared values, shared values are sustaining much as you have sustained me with your wonderful reaction tonight. And now you may try to pillar me, pillory me <laughs> with questions, and I thank you very much. I will, I will repeat the question, so don't think that you have to scream. But uh, then again, I don't have my hearing aids in, so scream. Or if you're a woman, you may come down and whisper seductively. That's the other. Yes, ma'am. General Borling, you have a wonderful sense of humor. Maybe, maybe I should say. You're thank you. You should thank my mother. Should I say awesome? <laughs> well, That's your favorite word. no, no, no. You know, it, it was George Bernard Shaw who suggested that you think about what you want to think about and uh, pretty seriously, but then say it with a fair bit of levity, and some of the stuff, frankly, is painful, so I do try to put a lighter touch on it, but you had a second part to your question. Now, what I want, really want to know is, have you always had a sense of humor that you have displayed like you have tonight, or did you develop this as you grew up? Did you, or did you find your sense of humor 
when you were cooped up in this little space in Hanoi? The question is uh, about a sense of humor. Uh, we all have a sense of humor. We all, we, la we all love to laugh, in fact. And we have the great instincts of laughing at ourselves. That's what bothers me about the Chinese. They don't know how to laugh at themselves. And they focus on previous dynasties, you know, the Ding Dong dynasty of, you know, 500 years ago. <laughs> rather than, that may not be an ex exactly historically accurate term. <laughs> but, but, but even the Russians in their heyday with the Soviet Union, under their, with their magazine Crocodile, were able to have scathing humor uh, so I look at nations in terms of the humor index as an indicator of maturity. I also look at their system of justice, much like our preambular construct says we establish this nation to establish justice first. I worry about justices departments that are not justice departments for the people rather than for administrations, and that seems to be endemic over many administrations. We need to correct that. I mean, we need, we need the IG, guys, to be the IG, the Inspector General. Uh, but to go back to this notion about, about humor, I do a thing called the Eight Virtues of Leadership, and one of them is, the seventh one actually is, the ability to laugh at yourself, the ability to see humor even when it's not there, as a carrying mechanism, both individually and the society. I had, my mother was great. Now, can I tell you my mother's favorite joke? Yeah. High school. One of my guys is over, friends, and he goes to my mother and he says, Mrs. Borling, he says, I want to get a girl who's, who's got it here. And, and I want a woman, you know, a young woman who's got it here, and a woman who's got it here. <laughs> And my mother said to Steve Ladd, was the guy's name, she said, Steve, she said, I understand why you want a woman with brains and why you want a woman with a little money. Said, why do you want a woman with arthritis in her hands? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should not have arthritis in our brains and be able to laugh. So if anything, I thank my mother for having that kind of orientation. Yes, sir. Did you come to Springfield about 20 years ago and have a similar presentation about the code? One of must have been one of your age mates. Uh, I have been in Springfield many times because of the Lincoln Academy that I referenced earlier. And I have been uh, with some unsuccessful forays into the political realm down here in Sangamon County. I don't think I've come down and talked specifically about this stuff, no. I heard a fellow 20 years ago talking about the code in detail. Well, it, there's, there's a number of us, you know, who are, you know. how, how did you learn it, and how did the others, and knowing that you're not. Yeah, the, the story's in the book, is I, uh, so, you know, if you buy your requisite 10 copies, you'll know, you know, they, uh, <laughs> next question. They, I uh, know, the, uh, the reality is it was shouted at me when I was in a place called Heartbreak Hotel, which was the first place really being worked over, I couldn't walk, so they were dragging me around like potatoes, but would hang you up like a pinata and do things to you. Uh, and one of the guys down the hall said about this tap code, put the, put the alphabet in 25 things. A is 1-1, one, one, B is 1-2, one, two, G is 2-2. Two, two. Figure it out, dummy. You know, about that time, he got hit, I got hit, we, you know. Uh, and then, scratched on the wall was this thing. But this code was brought in by the third POW who was shot down, Smitty Harris. Colonel Harris retired. And Smitty had been held behind at Stead Air Force Base, which was the survival school back in those days. That's why I went through my instructor training uh, as a survival instructor. And they, they basically it was, you'll never need this, but here's something you may think about. And in fact, he was the guy who promulgated it and ensured that it spread through the system. It was our only way of maintaining solidarity and resistance and passing information back and forth. I lived next to Robbie Reisner, I lived next to Jim Stockdale, and we would you know, pass those kinds of things along in order to keep that cohesion, keep the faith, do the best. And the answer was do the best you can. You're gonna get your, the indelicate phrase, you're gonna get your ass handed to you, then don't break. Stay in control if you can, 
And uh, so that was the reality of the situation. Yes, sir. Do you get to speak much to young young groups that need it? I, I do. I, I try to spend, uh, I'm on the road a lot in, in terms of speaking. A lot of it is not on this book thing. And I, much like the Medal of Honor Society guys, uh, and I'm helping the Medal of Honor Foundation the Museum Foundation raise up the Medal of Honor Museum in Charleston. You ought to look at that on the web, medalmohmuseum.org. Uh, Gary Sinise was the spokesman. Gary honored me with, if you look at the inside cover, with a few thoughts. Uh, and it's a very worthy thing. And they focus on the middle schoolers, but I really think they need to expand to all of America with the realities of the Medal of Honor. That's where the word hero comes full force. Uh, so yeah, I go out and, as I can, talk to smaller groups, classroom kids. Uh, you want a terrible story about talking to... No, I'm not going to tell you. All right. Uh, oh, you want me to tell you? 3,000 kids, middle school, 6th, uh, 7th, 8th grade, uh, inner city school but uh, very variegated in terms of racial structure. Uh, several hundred adults, huge auditorium, and I have been told I have seven minutes. Mm. And I said, okay, seven minutes. They keep coming out, you have seven minutes. Uh, this is in the middle of the program. So the guy is introducing me, and the lady comes out. She said, we made a mistake, go for 45. <laughs> and, the, and the guy said, this is General Borling, you know, and I'm on. And uh, so this required a certain amount of creativity and things. And the kids all had different colored shirts on. Uh, there were gray shirts, black shirts, and red shirts. And uh, so I was dividing them up into teams, and we were doing little contests and things. And we were, you know, kind of get them zinging. And they, they had a dark, like the the sides here, and I had, I said, go open up the window. So we, we filled the place with light, and I was trying to go through some quality of life things with them and, and, and not do what old people do, which is lecture to the young. It is our privilege. <laughs> it is their privilege not to listen. <laughs> we both guard our privilege with tenacity. But the world keeps rocking along anyway, so I'm rocking along and, and hacking the course, if you will, ju judging by some reactions. And, I'm, and I want to I want to talk about I'm talking about the three R's. And nobody knew what the three it was like the kids in Puerto Rico. Nobody knew what the three R's were, except the adults, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I it said, well, reading's right, but let's make it recognition and respect. Instead, reading, recognition, and then trying to turn stories out. And I said, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to find out in life, and I'm looking at this bevy of shirts out there, the gray, the black, the red. I said, there's good people, and there's black people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I really said that. And I said, and I stepped forward, I said, that's the dumbest thing I have ever said on a public stage in my entire life. I obviously meant good people and bad people. Will you guys give me a pass because I really screwed up? And they immediately responded with a yes. And I went on and made my remarks for another 15, 20 minutes, and I said, you know, I'm still laboring under that big screw up. And I could use a worse word than that. That's what I said to the kids. And they all knew the word, of course. Uh, and they all laughed. And I said, and once again, I apologize because that's not what I think. That's not what I believe. I was just trying too hard. Thanks for giving me the pass. The instructional part of that is, and they teach you this at Harvard Business School, that we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fail at something. And when you do, when they come to you, it's generally not the sin or the fault. It's failure to own up. And Harvard Business School technology or, or, or terminology is shine a light on it. Shine a light on you. 
And so they were willing to accept, as you are tonight, uh, an imperfect John Borling, but one whose bias is trying to be honest, trying to be authentic, trying to be worthy of your attention. I'll carry that with me to my grave. <laughs> Go ahead. You got to project because I can't hear what you're saying. She can't hear you here, so how the hell can I hear you? <laughs> yes, sir. Ten years ago, the Pueblo crew was captured, and they... The Pueblo, yeah. They attributed uh, to their uh, ability to go back to their SEER training, and I was wondering, you said you mentioned that you went through survival training. Did you also go through a, 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 a yeah. similar uh, yeah, the, training? The, the, question, the question was, when you go through survival training, you know, how to exist on, you know, rabbit's eyeballs and pieces of green this and that. Uh, do they give you Siri trainer, survival escape invasion resistance training, Siri, something like that. that's a Navy term actually. Uh, and yeah, we got some of that. They put us into a, into a POW camp, you know, locked us up into small boxes. Uh, the Navy actually did waterboarding. Uh, we didn't use waterboarding, but they beat you in the Air Force. We weren't as creative, I guess, as the Navy, but you know, you're closer to the water. So anyway, we, they did that, and it was very realistic, but it still was a POW kind of environment, and we did not get that ever with the Geneva Convention Accords uh, in North Vietnam. It got better, we all would have died up there, but uh, we didn't ever achieve, uh, we didn't ever achieve POW status. I will comment that we got wind of stuff uh, later in the war, and that was, uh, we certainly were told about all the anti-war stuff, but if you look back in history, you know, Abraham Lincoln had probably the biggest anti-war movement on his hands uh, as anyone. I mean, it's, it, look at the 1864, he's going out for 500,000 volunteers, and he says, if necessary, well, you know, you states will draft them. I mean, he was, uh, there was all kinds of, quote, excess, but we did get word about this strange thing that was happening in America. And that was that people were caring about us and that they were wearing these bracelets with our names on them. And after the war, I got back a thousand plus of those bracelets with heart-rending notes about prayers and thoughts and the effect uh, that I had and they're so glad that I made it. And I sat down and hand wrote answers to every one of those. You know what the strange part is? I still get back these 40 plus years later, 100, 150 bracelets a year with stories you wouldn't believe. And one of them is here tonight. Maury up there shows up with my POW bracelet that he wore as a boy and a picture of me on the day I got back to Chicago with Myrna and Lauren, that seven and a half year old, which I inscribed and I said, look, it means so much to you, it means more to me that you keep it, but that's the element of care factor that, that is in there. I will tell you that uh, you get Facebook things, you get calls, uh, Myrna is a little cherry when the divorcee in Kansas City wants me to pick it up by myself, but that's another <laughs> thought. Um, the reality is that the daughter after the war, Megan, is much more like her mother, and I was around for those things, but Lauren is me. And a little known fact that there was a great party at the White House in 1973. Do people remember when Nixon threw that huge party? Uh, we'd just come back February, March time frame. It was the largest party ever held at the White House. And later when I worked at the White House, as a matter of fact, we were able to cruise the White House unescorted, even up into the residence. You know, we're up there in the bedrooms and, oh, fruit of the loom, look at that. You know, and, <laughs> And they had in this big tent, and you know Bob Hope was the MC, and 
John Wayne and Myrna was kissed by Sammy Davis Jr. and John Wayne and they didn't ask to kiss me and I, uh, <laughs> Phyllis Diller was there. I didn't want her to kiss me. Uh, so this is this great party and years later Rex Scouton told me who was the chief usher when I was working there. He said, that was the best party we ever had. Nobody stole anything. <laughs> I mean, it's state dinners, you know, they're making out with the Dolly Madison China stuff. A little known fact. The Lincoln bedroom has an adjoining bath that has a lock on it. In fact, it was from that bath when in World War II, Churchill and Roosevelt had had an argument at dinner about the name of the post-war organization, and they couldn't agree. Roosevelt struck early in the morning with the idea, had Secret Service wheel him down to the Lincoln bedroom. Uh, they didn't, there's a lock on the bedroom door too, but it was open, he goes in, and Churchill is just emerging from that bathroom. As the Brit would say, Starkers. <laughs> and Roosevelt, according to a colleague of mine, uh, Doris Goodwin, this is where the story comes from. Uh, Roosevelt backs off and he said, I'm so sorry, Mr. Prime Minister, I didn't mean to disturb you and uh, uh, as only Churchill could. He said, I assure the President of the United States that His Majesty's Prime Minister has nothing to hide from the... <laughs> I tried very hard to share some things with you tonight in a light way and then in serious ways. I believe we need to do that throughout our communities and nations, mostly at community level. That's where the rubber meets the road. I'm an optimist about this country. We just got to keep marching. Look out there to all the metaphors that have ever been thrown out from shining cities on hills or beacons in the night or whatever. Let's not be afraid of our own idealistic, without illusions future. If some of that came through tonight, great. You've been great. Thank you. Thank you.